afternoon, everybody, and welcome to A Sea of Trust, creating a robust and inclusive global ocean, ocean data system. I'm Cathy Mulligan, and I am a professor of computer science at the uh, uh, University of Lisbon and a visiting lecturer at Imperial College London. We've got a great uh, session here for you today. Uh, and firstly, I'd like to introduce Mr. Lindwood Pendleton, who's Senior Vice, Senior Vice President for Science at the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean. Over to you. Thanks, Kathy, and, and hi, everybody. You know, if we're to achieve a healthy and sustainable ocean, we have to use data and evidence. And this really is the core idea behind the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Our actions have to be based on evidence. Uh, when we plan for sustainable development, it needs to be based on good information and data. We just don't have time to learn by trial and error. The ocean's changing so fast and human dependence on the ocean is so great. But if people are to use data, of course, they have to trust it. And it's evident now that the ways that we collect data and manage data are becoming increasingly complicated and complex. And more and more, they're removed from people and autonomous systems collect a lot of the data we use for the oceans, whether it's satellites or gliders or Argo buoys. The problems that we face with trust in data are not unique to ocean data. And there's a recent paper by the World Economic Forum and the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Japan, that really highlighted the challenges that the Fourth Industrial Revolution has created for trust in data, um, data sharing, collection, and management. And it's these issues that we want to really dive in today. So as Kathy said, we've invited a great panel. We've asked them to take a deep dive into their own personal experiences around building trust in ocean data and data systems. And, and then after that, we're really going to probe uh, these issues with a real virtual dialogue. So Kathy, let's get started. Fantastic. We've got, uh, thank you very much, Linwood. We've, we've got two great panel uh, discussions uh, today. Uh, the first one is with Peter Hogan, the Program Director at the Institute of Marine Research, Nina Epps, who's the Director of Global Marine and Polar Program, and Venetia Bell, Group's Chief Sustainability Officer, Gulf International Bank. And so I'd like to ask uh, each of the uh, participants to briefly introduce themselves and give their perspective around trusted data and why we need it. starting with yourself, Peter, perhaps. Yeah, so thank you very much, Cathy and Linwood and everybody for being here. I think this is a very timely uh, seminar or discussion that we're having uh, as we move into the decade of ocean science. And as Linwood was saying, uh, data and observations are, are key to, to, to trust and, and to, um, to making sure that uh, we get the stakeholders together. This is a science, not only for science, but for management. And my experience um, back in Norway is from 15 years of ocean management plans that we've been developing, uh, where you want to put all stakeholders together and share information and, and be open and transparent. And that's really important. Um, when we, for example, in Norway, uh, want to, uh, to, to develop a part of the North Sea for various activities, we have a lot of oil and gas has been there a long time. Um, the environmental NGOs have to trust the observations that the oil companies may make of where are corals, wh what, what areas do we want to avoid. The fishermen need to um, and trust the observations of, of, of uh, where, uh, where, where various environmental pressures are, are to be taken into consideration. And if they don't, uh, and if uh, somebody comes with their own data and other people come with other data, then simply things break down. We will not be able to do the, the, the integrated ocean management, this, the planning of sustainable ocean activities. And so I think we have some great examples of that in Norway. I'm also working very much internationally and with looking into uh, how, we, how we move around in, in developing countries uh, where maybe industries are fewer in the ocean waters, where, where data are fewer, scarcer. And uh, you have to work with the data that you have. You still have to manage, you still have to work in the ocean. You can't wait until you have uh, you know, funded and, and acquired a lot of data. And I think again, openness and transparency is really the only way to go. Uh, 
is not necessarily that uh, uh, you always need to only accept the best data and discard all the others. There are uncertainties in various ways with different data, but what is important is that you really appreciate the uncertainty uh, and, and, and are able to estimate the uncertainty. So you know which, which data are, are the best ones, the ones that you can really rely on in detail, and which other data, which may still be useful, uh, which are of are, are value uh, once you recognize the their limitations. So I think what, what is really, uh, what this is all about is to have shared experiences, to share best practices or good practices of data collection, data analysis, uh, and, and data sharing, and um, and uh, that's uh, that, that's how we how we need to go. If we bring people together uh, to discuss their various interests in an ocean area, and they don't have the same data and they just don't trust it, then then you won't get anywhere. My experience, I said, is from you know coastal zones, exclusive economic zones in one country, but I think this. Uh, applies perhaps even more to international waters once we are to discuss the access to resources the, the protection sustainable production and, and effective protection uh, you know um, there's so much room for misinterpretation and and uh, um, unsuccessful negotiations about access and so on unless you are able to share the data so that's my start thank you Wonderful, thank you very much. And you've raised some really important issues around trust and transparency that I'm sure we will draw on a little bit later. Nina, if we could turn to yourself now and ask for your sort of brief introduction of the topic and, and that concept. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here and uh, really delighted to also listen into the morning session. I think, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm working for IUCN, so that's the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Uh, very much, you know, a science driven organization, you know, again, putting out standard, etc, for the best available um, science. Um, so, and I think we can all acknowledge that, you know, uh, ocean science is absolutely crucial for society to meet our societal needs and also the SDG 14. Um, we really need to be looking at, you know, advancing integrated um, ocean science approaches in a multi stakeholder process. Uh, I think less emphasis have been put on uh, not just obtaining the data, but the repository, the access, the reusability, how do you ensure inclusivity, et cetera. Um, so I'm very much excited about this session and also looking at it from uh, also a data user perspective and, and be able to share my own personal experience. Um, I think everyone, work, everyone working in with ocean and uh, ocean issues, whether it's ocean governance, know that it is key to be able to, especially if you look at the high seas, how do you be able to get you know, data that's accessible to actually, for example, monitoring the human activities that goes on in this area? So that could obviously be um, both legal and illegal. Um, and I think there's um, a lot of different tools out there now that's being more that's uh, easily accessible. Uh, and I think I'm very excited about the opportunities that being able to access you know, this uh, open ocean data ecosystem and basically see how it can be used. Uh, listening to a little bit also about uh, from Linwood in the introduction, it was kind of like three words that kind of stood out to me. So it's trust, it's democratization, but also equity. Um, and I think it's, it's essential to, to look at it from that perspective. It's not just about um, trusting the data. I would say that the, the, the key challenge that we have is trust in you know, the different stakeholder groups and even sometimes within and then you have to ask yourself, what are what are the challenges or the barriers to data sharing? Because I think there is a perceived uh, experience that having data or owning, so it comes down to data ownership or also intellectual property rights. And I think it's perceived that it's a risk. Or um, so from my experience, you know, working with data in terms of like scientific community is very much about trusted peer review articles and if a methodology or standard is accepted by the scientific community, and then my experience working with the private sector and not representing private sector um, myself, it has really been on that, yes, they were absolutely open to sharing data, but it always come, came with a confidentiality clause. So it could not be made public. So you sit on all this data, but you cannot reuse it and you know repurpose it, so to say. 
And I think, you know, for, for private sector, uh, for them, it makes sense because it's a competitive advantage or it would be a disadvantage of sharing information. Um, but it depends, I mean, traditionally. So, for example, it always astonished me uh, working a lot with the fisheries sector. So the official, I'm talking now about legal fisheries, um, the catch data, the record, all of that is transparent. I mean, it's accessible uh, data recorded by catch, et cetera, or it should be. Um, but as soon as that becomes a commodity and enters into the kind of supply chain, um, it, you don't have that throughout the supply chain or from, from the private sector. Uh, and there's been a huge reluctance there. Uh, even if you look at citizen science, um, again, participatory approaches, but there's also a lot of distrust. If you take an example like coral reef restoration, there's a, millions of keen divers that wants to be engaged, that wants to contribute to this, but are they using the right scientific methods, et cetera? Um, and then when you look at, um, you know, um, even my own experience, the, the other day I, I was encountered by a pack of wolves and I instantly look, where can I report these sightings? Yes, it was a bit overwhelming. Um, and, you know, I got very different responses. Some people saying, no, are you crazy? Why would you report that? That's a risk. So I think we also have to talk about the perceived risk of the negative consequences, whether it's spotting a wildlife or whether it's uh, deep sea uh, science. And then finally, and my final point would be uh, looking at indigenous and traditional knowledge, not just a way of something from the past or tradition that you know, can help us move forward and do the you know, real science, but actually contribute and integrating. And I haven't really seen a working modality for that. So I know that so we'll go into more detail. So I think I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to discussing the kind of governance model uh, for this data. So once again, thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, some really interesting points there around what does inclusivity mean when you know you're trying to bring different parts of the world together from scientific to indigenous communities who probably have quite a lot of knowledge. Um, finally, I'd love to hear from Venetia, uh, you know, talking about that, uh, you know, commercial sector uh, viewpoint, so that would be wonderful. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really delighted to be here. Um, and I, I didn't think we would be talking about wolves today. So thank you, Mina. That's already perked my interest for more discussion of the session. That's great. So um, absolutely, Catherine, as you said, um, I have a finance perspective um, in the private sector. Um, I work for GIB Asset Management and for our wider bank. And so my perspective on this issue is very much how do we use finance to transition approaches to those that are more sustainable in relation to the ocean economy. And both that's reducing financing for destructive activities, pollution, overfishing, plastics, and also look to increase the amount of financing to more sustainable approaches, particularly thinking about low emissions um, zones, coastal protection, um, but also the approaches of the circular economy, where I think we're already seeing lots of really interesting innovations, including through the forums uplink work. Um, which I think has been really interesting so far, but all absolutely in need of financing in order to move forward. And data obviously is, is very critical for those conversations um, all the way through the, um, the, the finance life cycle. And I think you can really see that, uh, for example, in the Blue Ocean Finance Principles that were recently published, where data is really crying out through quite a number of those whether it be around risk management and having a holistic approach to measuring ESG risks, environmental, social and governance risks, but also the call for transparency, um, both with respect to the financing decision, but also then critically on the reporting, the assessment, that feedback loop from what has happened following the financing. Also, the, the point there about really being science led um, as one of the key ocean finance principles, and therefore thinking about how that science voice can really be integrated into how finance thinks about um, making a, a lending decision, for example, and some really interesting issues around the extent to which data provenance um, comes into, into that discussion. I think it's particularly interesting with respect to financing for blue finance um, projects, the fact that we've seen so many innovative financing mechanisms come to the fore, whether it be blended finance or more recently sustainability linked finance, which absolutely has 
data measurability at its heart. And they're raising some really interesting challenges for the finance sector and linking back to comments that others have made about the importance of collaboration and working together, um, cr cr absolutely critical for both sustainability linked issuance and also blended vehicles. And that's not really something that you see so much in the traditional um, financing approach. So I think lots to discuss and, and therefore really looking forward to everybody's perspectives. Wonderful, thank you so much and another important angle. So I think we're going to have a, a great discussion today. So maybe about wolves, as you pointed out, Vanessa, as well. So um, I, I would sort of like to understand your perspectives on how do you create trust in this data? You know, how do you determine that data is trustworthy? And what happens if we start to get a lot of different data sources that don't necessarily agree with each other? How can we work to understand which data is correct? I will open the floor to, to any of you who want to, to jump in on that one. Maybe I can start briefly, at least I think it's, it's, uh, it's definitely the role of, of scientists and, and qualified people to, to take up that role and, and volunteer to do so. Uh, it's not the only solution, but, but I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, to be expected that if you have, uh, um, for example, at least for environmental data uh, in the ocean, if you have a national uh, institute or, an, or a national uh, you know, directorate or whatever, to oversee this, uh, that, that they take this, this seriously. Um, it, it, I mean, we have, we have uh, government-led uh, data banks and, and data centers, which have been in existence for many years. Uh, problem is that some of them don't really contain the data that you need for the various purposes we have to develop a sustainable ocean economy. There are certainly um, good, good data around which are very well checked and, and very well quality control and so on. But, uh, but, but the problem is when you enter into other types of data that you really need. And, and, and then I think we need to develop mechanisms where we allow a, a bigger cohort, bigger groups of people to be involved than the typical government funded scientists. And, and that's the key. How, how do we go forward with that? I, and I don't think I should give the answer, but maybe let others speak and then see how we can, can for, forward that, that agenda. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, Mina, you, you've got your hand raised, but uh, you know, one, one question uh, would be what, what, what data is actually missing? But Mina, please go first. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much. Now, I just wanted to kind of come in and, and to your question about, um, you know, what, what is what is trusted data? And I think you then have to break it down again to the different, you know, stakeholder groups. So within the scientific community, uh, for anyone there, um, you know, um, data collected using, you know, uh, methodologies that are acknowledged and recognized by the scientific communities. Um, for example, IUCN has the flagship product, which is the IUCN Red List. Obviously, that has a structure and build up and how that data is collection collected in the different countries, et cetera, and put into a global database. But I do think um, a, a very key point is that, you know, scientists, they also within them, uh, they might produce, for example, now we're working on a, a tool which is called MapMaker. So really to using to see where um, uh, plankton, uh, marine plankton, actually the different hotspots and how they how they um, respond to different climate change. And that's a very good tool that will be openly accessible, et cetera, but not to kind of raw data itself. And I think even within the scientific communities, you need to look at it from a, you know, knowledge management. So that's, yes, yeah, scientists can collect data and do their peer review, and they want to hold on to that data until it's published, but they're not knowledge managers. So that comes back to the point of data packaging. So how can you work with the scientists to, to package this? Now, uh, I just wanted to comment as well on, on um, uh, Venetia's um, uh, comment there as well, and I'm really delighted to see different stakeholders and having the finance you know, sector represented, um, because I think the word of the day is really talking about blended finance. And we just uh, kind of embarked on a, a similar initiative, um, well, it was a very big kind of unique consortium, and my ch the challenge there is, is again, cultural uh, clashes and values and actually getting the different stakeholder group to trust each other. So the banking sector might say, well, we want to hold on to our, our data and this, and then, you know, so I think it's kind of breaking them. It's good to have blended finance, but I still think we need to build on that trust and say, what are the incentives and 
you know, to ensure that, you know, everybody agrees to these principles of, of, of sharing uh, data. Yeah, thanks. Fantastic. And I think you, you've raised uh, two, two points there that I'd like to just draw, draw on a little bit. Firstly, you know, how do we, how do we actually create trust? You know, I think someone, uh, you know, trusted data is like journalism. If the sources haven't been corroborated uh, by additional sources, you know, the, the data itself cannot be trusted. So there's all sorts of different ways to create trust. And the other angle I was uh, sort of pulling on is the, this idea that scientists, you know, they generally don't necessarily, at least in the universities I've worked in, manage the data itself. They, they would work with the IT departments who are experts in knowledge management. Uh, and so how do we bring all of those different things uh, together? Um, but maybe, Venetia, if you could uh, pick up on the blended finance question first, we can come back to the idea of trusted data, which makes me very excited. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, Mina, your point is absolutely right, that there's that first, you have to build trust amongst the stakeholders. And the first part of that is really understanding each other's language. Um, it's been really noticeable that, um, that first you have to really understand the, the other group's perspective, their background, their context, because often you are coming at it from very different angles. And so um, we have typically found that you have to spend a long time up front really understanding where others are coming from in order to build that platform. And that's absolutely also the case with then the data that you're both looking at and using. And different people have very different needs. And so what may be a trusted data source for one group, um, the other group don't really care whether it's trusted or not, because it's not really going to impact on the decision that they need to make. I think, Catherine, building on your points about how do you get um, comfortable with the data, Typically, what we find is that um, in bilateral discussions, it's very much that independent assurance, auditing, have standards been followed, have um, people got relevant kite marks for their data, are they publishing it and being held to account? Typically, when we're looking at data points of companies, we are basing it on what is publicly available. So if, if somebody has done something, but they haven't shared it, then that has um, lower acceptance than if they've published it, for example, in their annual reports, and hence it's been audited. So that's that's a, a good first step to, to building that level of transparency. And more broadly, do you think the role of auditing data will become increasingly important in these type of systems? Maybe Peter and, and Mina as well. Yeah, I mean, I can just briefly start by saying yes, and we've already seen that that particular trend towards increase um, in, in levels of assurance. I think um, I think that we've all been on a journey. And so there's further that needs to go in terms of education of what really does good look like. But um, I do think that's been a very helpful trend um, and supported by the regulators. Yeah, maybe I could expand a little bit on that. I'm coming back to transparency. I mean, you mentioned it, Vanessa, that it has to be what, what you find in the reports. And, and that's really a, in an open public space to share data. And I think it's not only something that you should leave to the specialists in, in the various disciplines and so on. We have tools now to, to create best practices. There's a website, oceanbestpractices.org, which can be used and where you know everybody is invited in. And, and then you can get, you can can benefit from it. Almost like crowdsourcing, you know, there are many many groups interested, and if as long as it's transparent, uh, they can actually contribute a lot. So, so I think transparency, transparency, to, transparency to me is is the number one thing, and then you have to build from there. But over to me now. Yeah, thank you. No, I mean, I think I, I echo that on, on, on transparency. Um, I just want to say, I mean, yes, there are best practices um, and a lot of different standards out there globally, etc. But I think that, you know, it all comes back to the verification and the validation of it. So that's why, for example, even in this new initiative that we have under the GCF, which is the kind of blended finance, you know, there's still... Um, let's say, okay, maybe IUCN is trusted to do the technical assistant, but you still want to have some certification of it, etc. So. Uh, IUCN, for example, when it comes to MPAs, um, uh, it's not only do we set a global standard, we actually do have a, um, you know, a green list, which is kind of like a certification program, which means that 
uh, the best practice has been independently verified. Um, so then they could be certified. You see very much the same. And I think I've also worked almost for a decade with eco labels, and that's also a way of advancing. So, for example, yes, there are distrust uh, between different stakeholders. Consumers might not trust the private sector, and therefore you need to have that independent verification. Um, and that usually that comes, if it's a commodity, it comes with like a chain of custody, which means traceability is key because otherwise you cannot have sustainability. But traceability doesn't mean transparency. They're different things. And I know there's a lot of new technologies that, you know, from going from the conventional paper trail, auditing, et cetera, to look at for blockchain technology. But I think that's also very relevant to trusted data. So you might think, okay, but then the blockchain is only as good as the data that's being put in there. So is, is there, do we then need another mechanism to verify the blockchain independently? So I think it's, it's yeah, it's, it's key to, to, to all uh, aspects, but definitely independent verification um, is, is, is a way. And I think that was created because there was a huge distrust uh, from the public for a private sector or within, or any kind of claims that a private sector would make would mean like, okay, maybe that's greenwashing, but that's again, where the independent verification comes in. Fantastic. And I, I think with technologies, it's always got to be a blend of human and technology. No technology can solve these kind of problems for you, connect as a tool. Um, I, I think that's a, a critical piece. We're, we're unfortunately coming to the end. So I wanted to just close this panel. We will bring you back as discussants at the, at, in a little bit of time. But I just wanted to close the session from each of you. What is the most critical piece of uh, work that needs to be done around data in your area at the moment? So Mino, we'll start with you. Just a few sentences to close. <laughs> so in terms of what is most critical or crucial to, to bridge this gap? Well, exactly. I, I, it's build, building trust and that's not that's a pretty big, big task. Uh, but I think you have to agree on a common set of, of principles. Um, and um, yeah, and also analyze, I think, the risks uh, in terms of um, potential risk that uh, can be perceived, but, you know, building trust amongst uh, stakeholder groups and within. Fantastic. And uh, Benicia, if we move to you, what's critical in finance? So in finance, um, the, the blue space is still very niche um, relative to, say, the green bond market and, and green related finance. So um, it's not an area that's typically talked about a lot. And so what I would really like to see is the mainstreaming of sustainable Asian thinking into the broader sustainability debate such that we no longer have to talk about green versus blue finance. There is a common understanding with Asian financing issues exactly at the heart of thinking about um, the financing that's needed for sustainable development rather than being uh, a niche not so well talked about area. Fabulous, thank you. And, and Peter, you've got literally a minute. <laughs> well, that's fine. I, I you th maybe thought I would say transparency again, but I'll actually say, you know, making sure that these data get available to everybody. We haven't talked a lot about democratizing and so on, but I think it is so crucial that we, we, we create the tools that allow all stakeholders to have a sort of an equitable, equal ac access to these data. And that requires building tools. It requires using expertise and ingenuity to make sure that it's not only that they exist these data somewhere in the database, but they're actually possible to get to from everybody, whether you have this kind of science background or not, or whatever your specialty, you, you should be, be able to, to get them in an understandable way. And, and that's a lot of work to be done in that aspect, I think. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope some of the audience potentially want to get involved in that as well. So we're going to move on to the, the second uh, panel discussion. Just to firstly, a very big thank you to Peter, Minna and Venetia. We will see them at, at the end uh, for the discussion session as well. We're going to move on to a second uh, panel, which is more about how do we ensure that we get reliable and trustworthy data. And again, we've got three great, great speakers here. Oh, sorry, my apologies, two great speakers. Uh, Aurelie Shapiro, the Chief Technical Advisor at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and Martin Bisbeck, Chair in Physical Oceanography, GMR Heimholtz Zentrum for Ocean, Oceans Fishing at Keele University. Um, so if we could start again with um, yourselves talking just very briefly uh, about your perspective on this particular issue around ocean data. And if we can start with yourself, Aurelie. 
Hi, thanks for having me. Um, and great to be here. Really great, interesting discussion. So um, yeah, I guess when we talk about reliable data, so I'm a remote sensing specialist. I work primarily with satellite data. And as you're aware, satellite data, they take uh, images from very far away, you know, out in space um, and from what's called a nadir perspective. So from above and, um, you know, that can actually lead to quite many uh, confusing issues, basically. I mean, if you ask someone to draw a tree, they draw a tree with the, you know, with the trunk and the leaves. Um, but a tree from above would look way different and almost could look like a bush. And so um, that's the issue with satellite data today is that, you know, we have a huge influx of data. There's a lot of data out there, but you really need to um, have more than just a satellite image to really see, you know, what is happening if you're mapping uh, mangroves or coral reefs or, or whatever. So, um, so in this case, um, and, and actually in every case, what you need to do is you usually need to validate satellite imagery. So you can't rely entirely on a on a data that's collected from you know thousands of kilometers away. So um, in that case, um, people use drones. They go in the water with boats. Um, you know, they go scuba diving. They take photos. They have GPSs and so on. And that helps. You know, I think add a really important, um, well, a validation perspective and a really kind of robustness perspective. But it also helps increase trust and reliability in your data. So you can say, okay, that thing that looked like a bizarre blob in my satellite imagery, well, I actually went there and this is what it is. And uh, drones are helping a lot with that now because with drones, you know, we do see from above, but you can also see from different angles and so on. And you can even, uh, you can even see things in 3D, uh, three-dimensional, you know, reconstruction with photogrammetry and so on. So this, this introduction of, you know, drones and photos and underwater cameras, and, and of course, all the technology that's out there with, you know, remotely operated uh, drones underwater, I think is, is helping us, you know, really kind of bridge this gap between satellite remote sensing and more what's called it's like proximal remote sensing. So being on the ground and being exposed to the things. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's kind of the perspective where I'm coming from in terms of in terms of trust and data. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And some interesting perspectives there on, you know, can you always trust uh, data if you look at it from another angle? Sometimes it looks completely different. Uh, Martin, if we could move to yourself, uh, that would be wonderful. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the introduction and also to all of you for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, I myself, I'm a physical oceanographer, so at times I do go to sea and actually measure what we find in the ocean. Um, you know, we used to do this with big ships. We go out for many weeks and uh, put instruments in the water and take samples like that or increasingly electronically. So the whole value chain from the sensor to the data flow to the calibration and then producing scientific results is very much uh, uh, clear to me. But we're also using an increasing set of robotic platforms. So those which don't need human interventions, they might need humans to get into the ocean, but then there are much more autonomous, uh, different types of them, moorings, gliders, Argo floats, things like that. But uh, traditionally, I'm coming from the scientific community. And I think in, in science and scientific data sets that are also used increasingly for policy, let's say climate assessments and things alike, I would say the scientific community uh, never trusts anybody else than himself or herself. So the scientific community is pretty rigorous about checking, double checking and triple checking, and in particular, if the data come from somebody else. And I think that's good because it basically means if the data sets from the scientific community pass the peer review, as it were, or the exercising from the colleagues and the peers, chances are they will find the mistakes and these these mistakes are usually not forged so they're not you know purposefully done but maybe a calibration step was not used maybe a sensor malfunctions and all that so so my first lesson from my own experience is you look over the results with a very critical eye and always ask the question, could there have been something wrong with the data? And there's many examples in Earth's history and ocean history, a very famous example is uh, the discovery of what at some point was called the great salinity anomaly where very low salinities were measured in the North Atlantic. And the publication said, we have measured a salinity for 20 years, except for these three years, the salinities were so low, they're not trustworthy. Now today, no, it was a real phenomenon, right? So, but I think what I'm saying is scientifically, they're very critical, so that's easy. But now with more and more data coming into the mix, so what is my experience? My experience is, uh, as Peter Horgan said, make them available to a wide range of users, make it easy to report on quality or issues with data set and exercise them as much as you can. 
Those data have been exercised many times. There's a high chance that these mistakes are not there anymore, that they can be trusted. Those data sets, which are only showed once for a particular case, you always wonder, is it really true? Was, were all the procedures done well? So my, my, my first point is, uh, you know, use them a lot for, for different circles, different groups, and see whether they survive the test of time or the test of critical interventions. The second step I would add too, sometimes when time is at a premium, you need to make sure that they're still true. Weather forecasting, you can't wait for many people to double check. So you have to have procedures in place where the checking is part of the process. And that can be done uh, with rigid data standards uh, and, and best practices as Peter Hogan went is one step towards that. But I think uh, finally in today's uh, system thinking, OSINT system thinking, we look at the same quantities through many data perspectives, remote sensing we just heard of, in situ data, modeling and so on. And now the name of the game is do these uh, different perspectives agree on some outcomes? So you're cross validating data sets from different sources. And that is also a very important step to build up trust. Which data do I don't trust? I have little trust in single measurements so somebody said I went out there, found something really odd, and you guys are all wrong, and I'm, I'm correct. I don't trust that a lot. So trust has to do with community building, access, multiple use, and following some procedures that are established and can be looked up and then certified. We tend to certify data sets these days, very important, and that then allows you to really take tough decisions on the data sets as it were. But still, it's a big issue, and it's increasingly an issue with more and more actors coming in, which I very much welcome. Uh, but we really need to establish these procedures and open up the data sets for scrutiny, and then as certifying those data that we have that have been scrutinized as a, of a high standard that doesn't say we should ignore the others but we should have different flags and saying you know high standard unknown standard maybe poor standard that would help thank you thank you very much some really important points there and uh, I, I guess it sounds like you think everyone should have an education in the scientific method at least when it comes to checking your data uh, um, <laughs> so um, you know, I, I think that you both raised some really, really very interesting points around uh, trustworthiness of data. So for you, you know, sometimes sensor fails, sometimes the, the satellite isn't giving you the correct uh, interpretation of that data. And sometimes, you know, we just get technologies that improve uh, so much, right, uh, that we, we can get, get a massive increase in knowledge and understanding. How do we acknowledge those trusts that that uh, those changes and still maintain trust in data. So Martin, I think you touched on it a little bit, you know, you know over time, scientific knowledge expands and changes. And we, we suddenly understand that those measurements of salinity were extremely important and correct. Um, how do we help people understand the changing nature of data over time? So uh, Aurelie, if I could go to yourself first on that one. You bring up a, it's a really interesting point. So psychedelic so technology changes extremely rapidly, um, as we're all aware. Um, and um, so, yeah, the technology changes over time. It gets better. We have more higher resolution, higher spatial resolution, higher temporal resolution. And um, well, not only does that lead to a little bit of bias, but really what people are looking for is interoperability. And um, one of the, I mean, one of the best examples of, let's say, long-term uh, data sets, is, as I'm sure you're all aware of, is the Landsat program which um, you know, the USGS recently made open and, and not recently, I guess it's about 10 years ago, but, uh, but all of that data is open. What it means is it can be recalibrated, re-evaluated re over time. And that can make it actually very um, you know, nice and, and consistent over time. But, and what's interesting is that, um, well then, so that became like, I guess a standard, let's just say the, the Landsat is kind of like a really nice long-term consistent uh, record. A lot of the new technologies or a lot of the new satellite constellations, they tend to calibrate to Landsat or they, they kind of all adhere to that. That's considered you know, a good representation. And so you have more and more satellites kind of intercalibrating to each other. And then you have things like Planet, which is the, uh, you, you know, this new technology with uh, hundreds of tiny, tiny uh, CubeSats. You know, these can vary and, and so on. The, you know, great advanced technology, once again, they do tend to benchmark themselves against, let's say, the Sentinels from uh, the European Space Agency, which are very robust. So everybody's kind of, there is a little bit of a moving baseline, but a lot of people are really making an effort to, um, you know, to intercalibrate and to kind of uh, standardize, you know, new technologies to that. But, but it's definitely true that, um, you know, if you look at anything after 2015, you can image almost anywhere with a really, really high resolution. Uh, but if you go in the past, that's just much more unlikely and, and there's a lot more data gaps. And so 
that also needs to be considered in terms of you know bias and so on and, and how to really look at uh, historical time series. Um, but I think the most important thing and what Martin just said is that um, you know with all of these different data sets and how they agree, it's all about the transparency and the methods. So I always am thrilled when I can you know read an article and they share their code, uh, whether it's on Google Earth Engine or R or whatever, and I can actually run that myself and see how it works and see the intermediate steps. And I think that makes a huge difference in terms of releasing something that maybe is completely different, like, wow, this, you know, rate of change is totally different. So if you can really make that transparent and, and you know, put that into the hands of people, I think you make a big difference in terms of uh, building that trust. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and for, for the audience, please do feel free to uh, put some Q&A or some questions into the um, chat box or into the Q&A function, and we will definitely try to get to some of your questions as well. Um, but Martin, if, if I turn to yourself around this, this concept of, you know, managing change in data, but still ensuring that people trust it, even though it will change over time. Yeah. So I think there's maybe uh, three important steps one can look into. First of all, as we just heard, it's, it's documentation and making this documentation accessible. So you have the metadata with the data you can follow and trace through where it all came from. That is good for the expert community. So it allows you to go back to the source and see whether everything is done right. That's really important. But the second point is, uh, as we publish our data, it's always possible to uh, allow for a, a better version. And we have seen many times in uh, environmental science uh, data records that sensors have been a problem. And these problems have only been discovered 10 years after the fact, where some fundamental issue with the measurement system wasn't known at the time. So it was the best available then. But looking back on it, you saw there maybe were some shortcomings. So now it is very important that you are able to release a new version, which maybe use a new calibration set. Uh, and it's now is the next level of understanding or the next level of data quality, as it were. There's many good examples where that has made a huge difference also in our understanding of where things are. Good examples of that is ship measurement at the end of the Second World War, where the, co the, the co correction that the UK fleet does was different than the American fleet because of one was out of because of the war, we saw a cooling in the climate that actually wasn't there. It was just a sensor issue. We had another issue with temperature measurements where the probe falling rate was estimated wrong, all used the same data set. Turned out that the measurements actually had to be redone and revised. How did this come out? Because the data didn't fit our understanding or the earth system simulation and they always looked odd, but we couldn't point to it. So it's the constant exercising and allowing for revisions to really incorporate the next step. So that's one piece of it. The second piece of it is to really not be ashamed to say, you know, there was something wrong with my data, but now it's better moving forward. That always helps. But the third element is you got to have, you got to guard yourself against vested interest. I mean, you know, for an oceanography, honestly speaking, you know, we don't sell our data because there's gold in there to be mined, right? So we were really trying to stay what's there. And if it's warmer or colder, it doesn't make a dent on my bank account. In other marine data, it might. Uh, so this conflict of interest that you also might have this data uh, is something that one should be aware of. Uh, so you can kind of say, well, would this particular investigator or system want to prove a particular point and is maybe inclined to sort of bias the data into a certain way? We don't want that in a trusted system. So it has to be neutrally. And that's where authorization comes in. That's where standards come in. And that's also where checking comes in. But but you can only have all of that if you really make it transparent from the, so it allows at least for experts to go back to the source. I'm not meaning that every customer should check that, no. But if the data is available to everybody to be scrutinized, and you know people have scrutinized the data set, I'm much more comfortable to use the data set per and not checking, if I know that was possible. If somebody gives me the brilliant data, but you said, but you can't look at how it's done, or nobody else can except me, then I have low trust. The worst statement, trust me, it's correct. I don't like that. That is all red, red flags for me to maybe not trust. So trust is about openness, about metadata, about following through the process, and about the ability to maybe change the data set if shortcomings have been found. Brilliant, thank you. And I think you've raised some, some important questions there around uh, the neutrality of data. So trust is created by you know people not being able to put their biases directly in, into that. Um, so Aurelie, I was just gonna raise with you, you know, 
touching, building on Martin's point around neutrality of data, what are some of the technological approaches you, you, you yourself have been, have been looking at around building trust and creating that neutrality? Is there anything you can expand? Yeah, I mean, um, so yeah, so I mean, neutrality is interesting when you use open data, for example. So open satellite data um, helps you be neutral, uh, you know, whether it's from the Europeans or the Americans, uh, that data is open. And so you can, you know, go there and you can evaluate it and you can look at, you can really, you know, dig, dig into it. Um, so, you know, that's obviously one clear step. And I think that, yeah, and, and you can, um, we also have, you know, like I said, the intercomparability inter, uh, of the interprocessing, you can do it. You can basically take an analysis that was developed on in one satellite and apply it to another. Um, you know, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, compatibility issue these days. And then of course, um, you know, Building on satellite data, of course, people recognize photos. If you go into the field and actually take a photo so from somewhere, or um, I was talking yesterday about glass bottom buckets. You know, you put your bucket over your boat and you take a uh, photo of the seafloor. You know, that's kind of right there, and that helps. You know, like I said, connect this kind of field, uh, this field to satellite, and of course, drones. Um, you know, the high resolution, the the really you know majestic images that you get from drones, I think, are really also helping people you know, understand and kind of, you know, help you, yeah, show, show what's happening there without this, um, you know, this distance of, of let's say, uh, satellite remote sensing. So I think that's, you know, that's really key. And it, it just goes back to the, the open source nature of it, the, the sharing everything. Um, a lot of my work now um, with FAO is in fact with the completely open source tools. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we share modules and we make scripts for people and we, we put that all, all out on GitHub and basically anybody can, you know, recreate these whole systems and build these things. And, and um, you know, that's what we need right now, that kind of creativity and that opportunity to give to people to um, to basically just multiply and expand and, and, and do whatever they can. And I'm not a great programmer. I can't really do much of those things, but certainly someone that we share our module with can go and, and use their, you know, use their, their own intuition and their own ideas to, you know, to build on these things. So that's where, um, that's what I think makes it neutral when things are really, you know, out there and accessible, obviously, and, and not, um, you know, not under a paywall or anything like that. Fantastic. And I guess that also gives us the question of how do we audit the code? But that's a question for a completely yeah, different okay. panel. Uh, <laughs> so I, we've had one great question, and I'd like to quote, close on, on this question um, from uh, an attendee who has said, how can we convince business leaders to justify the upfront investment in installing technology via the, the actual short-term economic benefits. So that there is a problem between the cost of some of these things, the economic benefit, but the overall actual environmental uh, benefit as well. Uh, so Martin or Aurelie, do, do either of you want to, to take that question? I would I'll, say that technology has an immediate sh short-term economic benefit. So I think even testing out new stuff and innovating and being very, really creative. Um, sorry, Martin, if I interrupted you. I think just being really creative and really adventurous um, has great benefits to many things, whether, I mean, it's, uh, it's a pretty broad question, but I think there's a, there's a huge advantage to just trying things and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So I would say, um, yeah, try That's, and fail. And, and you can always come up with a benefit out of the lessons learned. There is no I think downside. That's that's one side of the house, Aurelia. But there's another side of the house, in particular in ocean data, um, where you actually have quite a few commercial actors. Think about the extractive industry. It's about oil and gas and so on. I mean, they contract uh, private companies to do the work for them. They might not be the experts to do that. And these companies have non-disclosure agreements because they're in a competitive mode, as we discussed before. And in all of that, that's understandable, I guess. But what I don't understand, because they're operating within an economic zone of a particular country and I'm actually don't understand why any company why any country allows non-disclosure agreements to stand forever they're taking environmental data they would say have an immediate economic benefit let's say for sightings of oil and gas or whatever extractive industries you might think of but nothing would prohibit us as the nations to say you can have this non-disclosure agreement for three years five years whatever the number is but from that point onward all these data must become part of the public record. So this is a, a now, now this is an interesting element because we actually do have some private uh, 
uh, investors into observing systems which we never get access from because they're behind non-disclosure agreements. At the same time, when you make uh, data to becoming a public good, which is also traded or actually has a real value that might also entice uh, private actors to invest into system. Good examples are weather observing systems, which are mandated for weather forecasting. There's a lot of private investment in the installations of these systems because they know for the next 30 years, those data will be valuable and will be supporting a public good. So there's quite a rich question there. Uh, so I think making data transparent already for sure, but also making them part of the public good with all the uh, security that comes with this and all the need for the data to be there all the time uh, does spur investment into it. If you think about the array, which you know, the, 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 the Copernicus program, the space program, Sentinels, that's huge investments mostly done by governments, but they do it because they see that investment pays off over time with the value of the data. And this could also be done public-private partnerships, but it's the security of that data to be available on time, freely for everybody for the next 20 years, which is the business model. And not the not so good business model is non-disclosure agreements, which means one-time use only, and then their, their seem as have zero value. So they end up in some nowhere land and get never used There's, again. That is to be stopped. I I 100% agree, and I think it's actually really interesting what you said about those resources. If I could just say, like, I think that um, the public good, I mean, sorry, but oil resources that are in the country I live in or fish resources that are in the country I really live in, those should also belong to me as much as anyone else, uh, you know, as a taxpayer or as a citizen. And so I agree that a lot of that, you know, needs to be opened up and not protected. And there, uh, you bring up ESA Copernicus, but, you know, that's a huge investment. But if you look at how they get their investments back, it's not just in data, but it's building up the businesses that, that provide value added. It's building up the systems that deliver the data. All of the things that piggyback on that massive data source, um, I think are huge and that's a, a huge potential. And so, um, yeah, I wholeheartedly agree on the NDA you know, limit. And there's, I think there's other ways around that. There's flexible agreements around that, but you don't have to have everything you know, closed up. You can definitely um, so I think, no, this, share this it. Is a... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. So we do, sorry. We've, run, we've run a little bit uh, over time uh, there. So what I'd like to do is uh, invite the other speakers back in because I think they may also have something to say on this topic of, um, you know, the business model and creating trust. So, you know, corporations pay for that uh, information, that data, and they do that because it gives them a competitive advantage compared to other companies. So, you know, if suddenly we say to them, yes, you can have it for three years, uh, but uh, we want you to open that data up after three years, uh, you know, what does that do to their business model? So I'm not disagreeing, I'm just saying that, you know, we need to think through all of these elements and from a governance perspective, uh, in order to bring these data supply chains together effectively, because it, you know, quite often what you're, what you're actually saying is, we would like you to pay for the investment, but someone else is going to be making the money off that. And we've seen that fail so many times in data supply chains. So, um, and also, uh, so welcome back uh, to, to Peter Hogan, Mina Epps, uh, Venetia, and also I believe Peter, um, my apologies, uh, Linwood Pendleton uh, will join us as well for this session, which is going to be an open discussion rather than uh, more of a panel debate. Please do keep uh, sending questions through. I think it would, it, it's been a, uh, we've seen you've triggered some really interesting debates already uh, through your through your questions. So actually, I'd like to throw that to to Venetia. What are your thoughts around the business model um, uh, around data and its uh, sharing? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, thank you, Catherine. Um, I think really interesting just discussion to listen to. I don't have a great answer to it. It's a balance. Um, there are some things where you absolutely need to stimulate that investment. And where we've seen paid for models do really help drive that development, but equally huge role for um, for readily available data. And it's just how do you how do you get that balance right? Um, it's a it's a challenging one, um, and so I, I I think it's really hard to, to to form a view of that because it really depends on the the precise nature of the data that we're talking about. Yeah, and I, I think we're actually, in my personal perspective, is we're moving into a form of new type of data economy, um, you know, and, and we will have different incentive mechanisms other than NDAs and things like that. But moving on, opening the floor to, to the other speakers, um, you know, how, what are some examples where you've seen people create really good trust throughout a data value supply chain um, for 
uh, you know, ocean data? Is there somewhere where you think has a great example? Mina, your, your hand is up, go for it. So yes, thank you. I was actually going to, to respond to when you invite us in to also discuss about the, the business model, but it could be um, a nice segue into it. I think that, you know, um, businesses are saying what, what, what can encourage them to make that investment, you know, up front. And I think you also have to look at the reason for not doing it, as we've heard both Martin and, and, and Peter discuss. It's, it's about, you know, um, whether it's competitive advantage or you don't want to kind of disclose as data because you're working in, in, a, in a you know um, extractive industry etc um, but I think it's not just about um, not wanting to do because of competitive advantage uh, it's also about a reputational risk so if you look at a lot, lot of the deep um, deep ocean science etc as you said they are commissioned for example by certain operators in the ocean that had a certain interest and there might not be an interest to disclose that because depending on what they find, um, you know, that might not be live up to, I don't know, precautionary principles that are global standard. But I mean, I think that's that's one thing. And I absolutely agree that one way forward is to make a time bound. Um, I mean, if when you work with, like, say, creative agencies, when I worked on campaigns, they're very open about like, hey, this is exclusive right to own this for one year or three year or, you know, uh, because it should be a public good. And I I, I do feel, especially when it comes to the high seas, you know, it's the common heritage of humankind. So we should all be able to kind of access that. Um, and, and I think, so, so that was kind of one uh, bit of a perspective on, you know, the, the reasons to look at it, but then how can you get them to make that investment? I would say um, it comes for setting kind of international global kind of standards or rules. So if you have a um, an evil, uh, um, level uh, playing field, so to say, I think that so if it's required, and all businesses have to do that, then it's not like, well, why should I invest in this? And you know, my competitor is not, does it give me some kind of advantage? So I think agreeing on those kind of principles, I think would be very key. But I'll stop there, because I can see Linwin's got his hand up there as well. Absolutely, please go for it, Linwood. Great. Um, you mentioned, Kathy, it, it's really a supply chain. And we tend to talk about it as people collect data or people use data, but we don't really talk about what happens to the data along the way. And I see Claire Jolie has mentioned bringing in peer reviewers as one way of um, getting people involved in parts of the supply chain. I, I wonder if this group would just talk a little bit about what needs to be done along the supply chain to make it more transparent, to make it more valid, to provide that trust that we have? And is this a place where citizen scientists can come in and do things like annotate data, validate data? Is this a place where cybersecurity really needs to become an important issue, especially as we use these data more and more to monitor progress towards sustainable development goals and climate commitments and things of the like? Is there anybody from the panel? Peter, Peter, has your, you put your hand raised, go for it, please. Yes, yes, thank you. I, this is a very interesting discussion. I, I think, you know, we talk about scientists and different stakeholder groups and so on. I think the, the key thing with science, or the, the scientific method as we speak, is, you know, to, to, to always try to falsify theories and hypotheses and, and be out there and, and check. And I think that's something that everybody can do. You, do. you don't need a big science education to take part in this kind of review activity. Uh, at your level, so so I, th I think that's that's a way to to uh, to, to get more <laughs> manpower, more more people involved in actually engaging in in the in the peer review of, of the data. For that to happen, you need to open the data and make them available. And I think that's maybe number one problem we have is to convince data holders to actually release the data. One thing is new data that we are collecting, but there are historical data, and there are so many reasons. We've had a data culture, which is, you know, keep everything to yourself. And, and that's also the case in, in, in developing countries. It's not only in the, in the, in the data rich part of the world. So I think um, um, as we move into the future, technology, there was a question about that. The, the Global Fishing Watch, as he has mentioned in, in the chat, and that's an excellent example of things we can do today that you couldn't do some years ago. Um, that allows, uh, you know, everybody to see if you have a business that is not sustainable. Um, looking at 
uh, the various dimensions of that of sustainability. I mean, there are at least 17 dimensions, right? And the EU is now rolling out a ta taxonomy to look at what kind of activities can can be be funded and, and be get privileged in terms of access to, to loans and so on. And they're looking at some dimensions. They're moving into the marine environment now, but there will be more and more and more dimensions. Human rights is also indirectly part of the SDGs, even if they're not sort of highlighted there. So I think all of this in order to happen and in order to, to make uh, this, this happen in, in the commercial world is to have these requirements uh, for, for license to operate from the government and thereby from the public. And then you can get a pressure on uh, you know, having to document uh, the sustainability of your activities. I think there's a great hope in that and we should all work to try and make that effective. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, so Martin, I think you, you've got your hands up as well, yeah? Yes, so it's a very rich discussion and uh, Linwood, uh, thanks for some of the suggestion. If you look at the whole value chain of data, is there one model that is particularly fit for purpose? And I would say probably not. There are some very successful models. I mentioned some of the operational data streams that we use to run our countries. They tend to be pretty fail safe because they're so important to countries that they put a lot of checks and balances into these systems. Again, I mentioned uh, weather, but I could have mentioned other safety systems has to do with health, uh, with uh, floods, droughts, uh, but also other uh, issues of, of concern. So there are some models that you can use there, but there, these are data streams where the value proposition is very clear, uh, where the neutrality is very important. Catherine, you mentioned that. Uh, so that tends to be done in a government type setting. But now uh, with more and more data streams coming in, uh, that is not always like that. So we, we must have other models that go along. I would say uh, in, in some, also in the scientific community at times, and Linwood, you are fully aware of that, sometimes it is more important to publish the data, uh, that the paper on some data that you've collected and the extra funding that it takes to make these data accessible to all, to put them in a proper shape. You mentioned citizen science to annotate data. Well, that's kind of a cheap cop out, right? You're, so you're using sort of free labor to do the work that actually should be funded in some sense. Not to say that it's not great to engage citizens in some of the work, it's really fantastic. But the operational uh, uh, production of data sets maybe shouldn't be done like that. Uh, but for new data sets, that's, that's really great. But what I think is more exciting to actually have citizens fully participating in generating data uh, that, are, can, that can be used for environmental protection, for environmental assessment, all of that. And there's wonderful examples of that out there but again some of them then right go into a more organized data sets and streams and best practices as peter said you don't have to be a trained scientist to follow some of those principles but it's really that type of engagement from from the broad set of stakeholders that is needed but i will say at the end of the day when data become really important and you want to base decision on it most people trust governmental and intergovernmental procedures. That, that means the international databases, uh, which get checked. That is true for WHO for health. That is true, true for WMO for metrology, uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission for ocean. And if you empower these organizations to be more impactful, to be standard setting, to be watching over the procedures, I think we're making a lot of progress on data. And, and the ones that we do hang policy decisions upon for example, on climate change, they get vetted a lot. And these data sets get checked many, many times before they get out there. And I think that's the type of thing uh, we should establish. So it's not free business, but when it's important, it can be done well. And we know how to do it well as a community, but in ocean, we're all over the map. In some areas, it's really fantastic. In some areas, it's a disaster often underfunded. Uh, so we need to get better at that. And, and as soon as they become more and more valuable, which I think is happening right now, we need to step up and also be explicit about the cost and what it takes to really produce reliable and trusted data sets. Yeah, I think you raised a really interesting point around, you know, the, the actual true cost of doing this effectively and, and well. Um, so I'm, I'm just a little bit conscious of time. We're getting a flood of really, really good uh, questions through here. So I want to make sure that the panelists get the opportunity to answer some of them. So um, one, one is, as a company, how to balance providing data in an open source uh, manner 
without earning real revenue uh, from the data. That's always an issue um, with their particular investors. So they're asking for ideas uh, to respond to that. And I think that also touches on another question that's coming, which is how do we enable public-private cooperation to increase trust in data sharing? Um, so is there anyone who would like to jump in on that particular, uh, those particular set of questions? Does anyone have any advice for someone who's trying to uh, create these data? No, wow, okay. So actually, I guess what, what I can, I, I can talk a little bit about a project that I work on um, within the WEF uh, called the Data for Common Purpose Initiative, um, where we're looking at uh, governance models for different types of data supply chains. Um, and we released a report actually earlier this year, specifically around creating trust uh, and consumer trust in data sets. Um, and so I think, you know, the issue around creating the public private cooperation and ensuring a balance of profit sharing across that is one way to think about uh, creating a value that can, you can actually go to your investors and talk about. Uh, so there's an entire report, it was released in April, um, and I will, I will put the name of that report into the chat for you. And perhaps what we can do is move on then to the next question, unless anyone has decided they have a great answer to help them with their investment case. No? Okay. Um, and next, another question is, you know, if the data we would like to access is in proprietary formats in Excel spreadsheets or on servers, and getting access to it is really just the first, first step, you know, how do you curate that data um, you know, as a large part of that data supply chain that you were mentioning at, at the beginning of the, the discussion, Linwood. So does anyone have any thoughts about the curation of the data in the value chain process? Linwood, your hand is up, so I will turn to you. Well, my hand was up for a different reason, and I'll come back to that. But when we really think about curation, I think we have to build into our data platforms more um, artificial intelligence and natural language processing like we see with amazon.com or um, TripAdvisor or things like that. You know, we can learn how to create data by seeing how people are using data and, and how people are combining data, where they're getting it from. And we can hear from people about problems they're having with data, data that they think is really good. Uh, it gets back to Peter's point originally that there are lots of different kinds of data. And if we only go for the very high quality data, we're missing out. And there may be a lot of data that do not meet these high standards that Martin's talked about um, and Peter's talked about that are still quite useful, but you need to be able to find it. You need to know what the caveats are. And so that can be done automatically. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn from the, the rest of the world, particularly the retail world and how to create these data. So Fantastic. I'm going to put my hand back up for the other thing. Oh, okay, for another, I'll come back to you in a moment then. But, so, uh, Martin, you, you had some thoughts about the supply chain? Yes, uh, I do. I mean, I think uh, correct, Linwood. Uh, certainly, in some sense, uh, accessing different formats and so on is tedious. We've, I mean, we are the generation which probably spent too many days in trying to format one data set to another one. This can be done much smarter these days. And but these um, these automatic um, data gatherers, uh, quite a few around, uh, which I'm in general in favor of. But we do learn that you know, transporting with the data, the metadata that give a descriptor of what it is that you are. I mean, just the fact that there's a number and a unit behind it is not yet a quality statement, but if you sort of know what platform it was taken from, who was the uh, originator and so on, it becomes more valuable. But I would agree with you, Lynn, but uh, it, it making it uh, available to those harvesters is good. But then the, I can ask the question, so what can I do as the generator of the data to be more harvestable? And for that, there's actually good practice out there that one can do which isn't so expensive so it's be easier to harvest and then ai and the big data gathering machines have a much easier time to actually take the best elements of your data set out there so in some sense we have to teach ourselves our data producers a little bit how to present the data in a way that is machine findable and then accessible through the intelligence that can runs behind it and but there are some steps that i think the data providers need to take if they take it it's much easier if they don't take it it becomes you, you might not get the same value of the data that there already is there thank you 
Fantastic. Morali, you made a very interesting point here in the chat, um, but uh, perhaps you can just sort of expand on that a little bit. Yeah, no, I just thought it was interesting because it's true. I've been um, going on and on about uh, open data and everything should be free and open source, but um, you know, there are still, I mean, open source doesn't mean uh, just giving away things. I mean, there's a lot of it. There's examples of, you know, people who can benefit. I mean, you can, there's different ways you can uh, get an economic advantage, uh, you know, through something that is still open source. Um, but I thought, you know, like, as we were saying with, you know, the ESA Copernicus, like, for example, all that data is free, but there's a lot of opportunities to build businesses around that data and to build value added services. Um, just, there's an example in Germany, um, they're considered like the unicorn uh, data provider, they're called LiveEO, and they, um, they, they basically took freely available data in the beginning and they map how close the vegetation is to, um, to uh, train tracks and in Germany. And so they sold this concept to the Deutsche Bahn, to the German train company. And, you know, it's a marvelously simple thing. I, anybody maybe could have done it, but the fact is they built this company around it. They had a customer, they're using free data, but they're adding value to it. And so there's, and they're probably even using free uh, software. I don't know. But um, so the point is you can still, I think, you know, incentivize and, and benefit economically from free data. And that's, and I think you actually probably have more uh, potential business opportunities from a giant data source like Sentinel than a proprietary source, um, you know, which is just in a whole different world. So like if you had really, you know, and I'm not saying anything against super high resolution data, that stuff is, is fantastic, um, but it's, you know, it's very expensive to produce and, um, you know, it's a different, it's probably gonna be a different user base and there's, you know, different uh, elements that'll be built on it. But there's, I don't see, I don't see as open source and, you know, economics benefits to be mutually exclusive. Fantastic. So I guess maybe yeah. we can build upon that a little bit and ask for, uh, you know, success stories uh, for around, you know, where, where have you seen success stories around opening up data? So, for example, meeting the care or the fair standards. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on that? There's some success stories we can talk through. Uh, Mina, your hands up. Over. Yeah, similar thing. I had it up uh, before recent, but I can get back to that later. But in terms of um successful example i think i think that's key right we believe in the power of good examples but i think we also have to acknowledge that you know data in itself is big business um if you think about but to your last point is saying and i think Aurélie made a fantastic point of saying it doesn't mean that because it's open access you're giving away or your position but if you get more to kind of to buy in to create i mean you have you know more power in the data that you have um one example for example working um um because somebody mentioned retail i mean think about every transaction we do with our mobile all the barcodes and scannings i mean that's such invaluable data and to businesses they want to get hands of that because they want to create you know products but they want to um tap into that and what i found is that uh, being um a uh, non-commercial uh, actor so to say you actually get access to a lot of the commercial data so i'm not talking about scientific now uh for, for free because you're trusted with it because you're not a competitor. So I think that then give, gives you a perspective. For example, I went to, um, uh, what are they called? The Nielsen company that tracks all, all these data and basically looking to say, okay, individual companies, et cetera, can buy the data. But if you can put it all together and then you can really try to mark and, and track progress or how well you're doing to meet the sustainability target and it's kind of independently verified, there were lots of confidentiality clauses, but it really, I think having that kind of data as a neutral party that's not going to use it to your disadvantage can really help you um, to kind of open that kind of dialogue. And, and also to, um, to get back to, um, you know, this advantage because now it's so quite easily, but I think it still comes down to the, everybody's seen the documentary Social Dilemma. And I really think that's also what it is uh, what are our key principles or values that we share that we can agree upon? So at the same time, there's a movement for GDPR in terms of protecting a person. Could we come up with something similar, but does the opposite for the common good? And also to make sure, for example, that you know, public funding that both researchers use, scientists and uh, international organization, I mean, public funds should be used for public good. Um, so that's um, one thing. And I also think we need to think very carefully about, um, you know, the, um, the, the, the skill set or the labor market. So, so um, 
citizen science, I think scientists have a role to play there by actually doing a bit of the capacity building. So for example, the, the Ocean Fund has teamed up with, has a um, public I mean, uh, citizen science campaign, but they're teaming up with the scientists that would then give them, send them the easy equipment to do this. So I think that's also a role that the scientists can play more. Uh, when you look at the more advanced technology, it's also a question about um, what are the, the labor markets for this? And you also need to update that and keeping track of it because as they evolve in a rapid pace, how do we ensure that? Uh, but in the interest of, of, of time, I would stop uh, there. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very, very uh, um, comprehensive uh, response, which is very useful. Um, so I know that everyone's got their hands up, maybe for other questions. So uh, Linwood, I will come back to you very briefly before we, we just round up this session. So you have your yeah, I'll just sort of I'll just make turn my questions into to two short comments, and then we can think about this later as we go home. The first is to just point out that when we talk about ocean data, there's oceanographic data there's biodiversity data, and then there's human use data. And the, the standards that we hold oceanographic data to may not be standards that we can hold the biodiversity data to. And if you look at the ocean biodiversity information system, a lot of that data is in fact just one observation in one place, and it's really valuable, um, even though we wouldn't trust it necessarily for um, oceanographic data, like Martin was saying. The other tension I keep hearing is this desire for democratization and lots of different kinds of data with this fallback to let's trust the scientists, let's you know trust the national data centers, let's trust certification schemes. And all of course, all of those things work against democratization because they create bottlenecks, they create power. If we look at the World Ocean Database, um, which I think is a very authoritative set of oceanographic data, we currently have fewer than 30 countries providing data to that database out of the 150 World Ocean data countries. Um, and two countries provide 70% of that data. So to me, that doesn't seem very democratic. And that's because the bar is really high. The cost of producing the kinds of data that we want is, is quite high. Um, so we have to figure out how to bridge this tension between wanting authoritative data and having a, a broad variety of democratic data. Uh, fantastic. And Martin, you, you had your hand raised as well. Yeah, I think uh, Linwood, uh, that's a good point. But if you ask the question, how much countries produce their data from space is even less. So that's, I think that is not a good way of accounting. It's, it just is, it's just a fact of how much infrastructure it takes to get to the deep ocean. That's where these data sets are poor in terms of country diversity. But let me give you a different example that speaks to this democratization limit that you were talking about. For example, and, and, and Catherine, you were asking for success stories. Uh, here's one from a very different angle. So we worked with some colleagues from Angola who had actually a 25 year long data set of uh, environmental conditions of their ocean space, talking with sort of like data sets Linwood that you would only attribute to some other countries. But they weren't actually sure about the quality of the data and because they were not sure about the quality data, they didn't want to share it. So it was more a statement of insecurity of, of they don't want to expose a bad data set and everybody laughs at them and say, you cannot, you can't even run an instrument X, Y, Z. So here the trust building was done differently. So we worked with the colleagues there and worked with them and allowed them to go through their own data to build up the trust in their own data set through the methods they've been using. And, you know, two years into this project, they were actually willing to release the data set into the public sphere. But but they were not willing to do it before. Here, the motivation was very different. So it wasn't economic propriety. It was basically not being sure of the methods that they're using. So that's an element. But Linwood, I do agree with you. We do want to have a diversity of information coming in. And, and indeed, we have to think about uh, standards, how to ingest them. But I think, again, even if, a, if the data come in from a very diffuse uh, source with diffuse uh, uh, certainty, but then you have many uh, massive amounts, you can use statistics to build up that trust. But at the end of the day, uh, for almost all, if, if you want the data to be informing decision making, uh, people do expect some level of trust, independent of what the source is. So you somehow, uh, 
have to set up a procedure that builds up that trust. I, I'm not saying that the governments are the only trusted entities, uh, but they're the ones that we know, <laughs> uh, but there could be others. And we have, uh, and as I said, I, I'm, I'm talking about international sets, that sets up more than national governments. I wouldn't trust every nation, unfortunately, but international systems, I do trust more. And, but they could also be built up out of NGO sort of sources and things like that. But it, but you know, you end up landing at UN or UN-like organizations if you really want to have that trust. And it's it's hard for me to imagine any other system that isn't international in scope, but it doesn't have to be run by a country. That's a very interesting point, actually, Alan. You give me a great segue to my next question, which is to Peter, actually. I believe you work with uh, the high-level panel. Um, do, do, have you got any thoughts about using or what the sort of work that's been done there about prioritizing all of these very diffuse uh, data streams that, that uh, everyone has sort of touched on? Uh, I don't think very specifically on data streams, but certainly uh, the, the tasks uh, given by the high level panel to the, to the expert group has been to identify what we call opportunities for action. And there's a number of opportunities for action within uh, Within, within ocean data, both data collection and, and, and sharing and, 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 and uh, working with data. So, so uh, um, and, and that holds again for using data to the best possible way of securing a development of, of a sustainable ocean economy in their different forms, the energy, the food, the transportation, the, the whatnot, and also the, the natural capital, which uh, which is sometimes left out of the of the discussions in the, in, the, in its proper way and, and that it should be. So, so I think uh, um, I, I don't I don't think I have anything very specific in terms of of different types of data or different groups. But again, uh, getting these um, these these data sets out there and and making them available is is uh, kind of the number one. And then there are ways in which you can do that. By still keeping some of the the commercial interests uh, uh, protected, uh, both both in in a certain time and in in different ways of making access to 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 data, if that is the case. But uh, yeah. fantastic, thank you very much. So we have uh, Mina and Aurelie. You both had your hands up for a little while, so I will uh, pass to Mina first and then to Aurelie. Thanks, and, and thank you, Linwood, for picking up uh, you know that that tension between these kind of different. Um, desires. And, you know, I, I just also like to emphasize that we're talking about data like it was one unified thing, right? So there's a lot of difference. We said, well, you know, you did visual oceanography, you got different. So it's many different layers. And I think we, we have to be realistic. And yes, it's true that when you're looking at, you know, those global processes in terms of, you know, let's say the CBD for the post 2020 global biodiversity framework, you ne need to set targets and have science uh, science-based targets, et cetera, and, you know, monitoring, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, so, so I think that that absolutely needs, you know, a certain level of rigor, but it doesn't exclude the other one. And we're still, what I like to come back to here is that we haven't talked about much about the indigenous and traditional knowledge and uh, any way for kind of integrating that, because it's all in these high level policy texts. They all use that, but we haven't really seen, um, any kind of mechanism for, for doing so. So I, I think that's uh, still is, is a major kind of block, like how do you actually bring these two, two groups um, together? And I think I'd just like to, because I know we're running out of time, so it might not come back. And uh, just to say that I, I like to give a little bit of analogy because you said, uh, Catherine, let's be creative. You know, how can we be creative and think outside the box? So having worked with a lot of creative agencies, I've learned a lot in terms of, it's absolutely all about co-creation. And the analogy there, it's like, you know, think of it as an exercise of building a brand. You need to build a brand. So, so what do you do? I mean, you look at the perception of identity, you build like loyalty, you build awareness, you increase the you know, awareness of the brand um, and also, um, you know, improve differentiation. And also most importantly, you, you, um, you enhance the experience uh, with value. And I think that's also key. How do we use it? So. Uh, make it easily accessible, but to see the value of this. So I think it's also a little bit of a, a marketing exercise um, to really um, put, put a value uh, and embarking down this road, but uh, very interested to, to listen to all the comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you make uh, some good points there. So I'll hand over to Aurelie, uh, and then I think we've got one more 
uh, before we move to wrap up and close. So, um, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to respond. <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to respond. I thought it was interesting what Martin said, just um, to going back on how you know you you're saying like you trust NGOs, um, you know, with data. And I I would actually disagree. I mean, I come from the NGO world, but I would let's say you know I think WRI produces great data, but then if you have an NGO that could be biased in terms of what they want to show, um, you know, I could say come from WF. I think a lot of our data was in fact biased towards our message. So NGOs is a very broad range. Of course, FAO is an NGO and. Uh, I, but I think, you know, ha, publishes very, very rigorous data, you know, FAO stat and everything. So uh, not, NG, not all NGOs are the same, but also not, you know, private companies are not to be trusted. I mean, well, I'm sure nobody here actually trusts Google, but we use their data all the time and we use their software all the time. And um, there's a lot of great things, you know, that come out of a big company like Google. So I think uh, in terms of trust, you know, whoever it's, I think there's a, there's a really wide range in terms of, you know, who is providing that data and, and who you can uh, depend on. I think. Don't trust verify, right? <laughs> okay, Venetia, yeah. you've got uh, just, just one minute and then I'd like to hand over to Linwood um, to, to close. Absolutely, just a very final reflection from me in that um, we talk a lot about um, big aggregate data sets, but it's important to remember the entrepreneurs on the ground and the communities that are really in the front line. who will often never have read a peer reviewed journal nor have access to the internet or big data sets. And so how, how are we empowering them to come up with solutions? that may fail, um, but um, a lot of that is really driving innovation that is really going to make a difference. And so being sure that we have those people also at front of mind um, when we're having this debate about the quality of data, of what, what really would help mobilize the change that, um, that we need to see in terms of those innovations that really will make our, our world more sustainable. Fantastic. I think it's a really important point. We talk a lot about, you know, trustworthy data, but also helping people to understand how to interpret data they're given. Um, and, you know, indeed, um, fortunately, for most of the world, they haven't read an academic paper. So, you know, they can be enormously dry and boring. I, I just wanted to say a massively big thank you to all of the panellists and all the speakers today. Uh, it's been an absolutely incredibly interesting discussion. We've had lots of uh, interesting discussions around reliability and trustworthiness of data, discussions around governance and actually how many open problems there really are still left. How do we integrate Indigenous data into these very scientific data sets and ensure trustworthiness? And how do we ensure you know, the use of data standards like care and care can actually help to live the world um, a better ocean environment? Um, I'd like to now hand over to uh, Linwood, however, to talk a little bit about the next steps in the context of the ocean decade. So Linwood, um, please. Uh... Well, I think what we're going to see and what we've really heard in these last few minutes is that there's just so much heterogeneity here in terms of what we need the data for, where the data are coming from, and, and what is the right level, whether it's quality, authority, or um, accuracy, or even openness. And so the, the decade really, I think, is going to be a decade of getting into the weeds, starting with regional stakeholder working groups to try to figure out what is the right level of trust? What is the right level of accuracy? What is the right level of rigor? And, and what data do we need? When and where? And, and so I think that the key to solving all of these problems is for us to be extremely aware of the heterogeneity and find really creative ways of bringing this multitude of users and data providers together in a way that works. Well, that's a fantastic note to end on and uh, a big thank you very much. And I think that's the end of the webinar. Thank you. <laughs>